Yeah, well, I don't really know where to start because there's so many questions I have uh, just regarding this film and then, of course, all the other films. Um, let me see. Um, well, the, the best probably to just start here with this uh, film that we just saw. Um, tell me where the idea came from. Um, I was just thinking when I was looking at it again, um, whether or not you were actually in the army. Being from Israel, I suppose you must have been. And if you had any similar experiences, and if there's I, any sort of autobiographical elements in this film. Uh, everything is, uh, my parents are here, so I have to be very, very careful about what I say about my family life. Um, Especially about um, your mom. The father and mother figure are based one-to-one -one on my parents. They're exactly... <laughs> <coughs> these are these are my parents you're seeing. As a matter of fact, we saved some money, and my parents are actually the actors in this film. No, I, I have a very wonderful uh, family life um, and uh, wonderful parents, and um, I also have two lovely kids. So I have a very normal situation, and uh, for me, this is where I kind of use I use my work in order to kind of um, relax a little bit into uh, my fantasies, kind of take over. I'm glad we got that out of the way. Yes. You know you. what they say about Israelis? <laughs> what do they say about them? <laughs> the non-funny Jews. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, um, no, uh, no, yeah, um, possibly. Um, I grew I'm just up mean you proved that wrong. I, I, um, I didn't go to the army because I, um, we moved here uh, a few times. Uh, well, we moved here when I was a teenager, and so I, I, I grew up here, and maybe I um, acquired some sense of humor here. Um, and, um, <laughs> and I didn't go to the, uh, I wasn't in the military because I, uh, I'm also a diabetic, so I had to uh, show up at some point, do a couple of push-ups, and um, I was uh, relieved of that um, uh, privilege and duty. Um, so I, I didn't go through this kind of uh, typical uh, Israeli experience, and I think in some regards, uh, maybe the work is uh, in a way, um, you know, the, uh, this, the, the sort of the perversion of what a family life involving military duty is like. I think the work definitely uh, picks that up and tries to sort of run with it, but uh, in a very non-Israeli context. But describe the three different um Daniels, if you will. Um, what, 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 how, do you, how would you describe the three different characters? Um, it's, it's important to think. I mean, I, I did have a chance to read the, the description for the program, and certainly the, the, um, the movie is very open. It's, uh, it's ambiguous. I, I'm the last person to know exactly what's going on in this, uh, in this family. But um, my, my take of it is that we're not looking at people who've actually suffered... Um, an actual loss in the sense of uh, a soldier or a son uh, having been killed as a result of the German sort of participation in ISAF in Afghanistan, but rather uh, it's a more abstract and a more horrific loss, if that's possible, uh, when you're talking, comparing it to the loss of a son. Uh, there's nothing real in that loss. It's a loss of, you know, they're in midlife, late midlife, they're uh, upper middle class, they have the means to kind of um, realize, in a sense, their fantasies, and something is wrong, obviously. Something is amiss uh, in between them, and uh, it is about that sort of the horror vacuum, the, this kind of great absence that exists between them, that they begin to develop uh, a very ritualized uh, restaging of what family life is like. So maybe they did have a kid, and the kid died. Maybe the kid never went to the army, or maybe... Uh, maybe they never had one, and, and this is a, a kind of very late uh, way of, of uh, fantasizing about what that kid is. But um, the three uh, young men that they invited to their home, um, for me, they're, they're uh, male escorts. Uh, the first guy is very young, and he's unable to uh, return or inhabit the role that he's, he's been given, and he tries to explain to them, and they cut him off. He tries to say, well, you know, in the couple last couple of months I've just been with men uh, because those are his customers and uh, the father of course cuts him off because he doesn't want to break the illusion. So what, what we're watching is a very sort of mannered, very theatrical sort of restaging of family life and there are some very uh, basic rules about that. You don't break the illusion and the young son tries to break the illusion and say look I'm just not used to 
uh, having, I'm just used to getting uh, men who drive up who want to get sucked off and uh, drive, drive off again. And I'm not used to sitting in front of a family and uh, this, this, this kind of uh, task, this kind of responsibility, and he kind of freaks out. And so we have three different portraits of what or who could in inhabit that role, and each one of them brings different skills and different um, uh, weaknesses or issues into, into the task. The first one is very young, he still has braces. Uh, he's got the tongue piercing. The second one is a bit more macho. He's a kind of a, a storyteller and uh, returns the, the mother's affections, whereas the first one doesn't. And then the third one is, of course, uh, a, a kind of uh, a con man, a sort of a liar who uh, enjoys uh, the relationship, is able to cry with them, but it's important to note that none of these sons fit or there's uh, an appetite that's bigger than any of those ones and it causes them to be this kind of uh, serial consumers of, of young men, of young flesh. And um, you know where that relationship is in terms of conflict or in terms of war is a very open question in the work, but uh, it's not, of course, incidental that they're wearing uniforms when we first see them. Yeah, I was thinking about like how each episode perhaps could also represent the experience of each individual, of this particular experience. You know, the mother wants to see it in a certain way, the father wants to experience it in a certain way, and the kid wants it to see it. Always in each time with the idealization of who they want to be and who they wanna how they wanna want to be seen. Yeah. So it's very much sort of like uh, about how, how, like sort of like an illusion of a certain scenario, of a certain, yeah. So I guess in the end, it's much less about the experience of war than about uh, really fundamental human relationships. Well, there are some very fundamental, some very perverse family dynamics at play, obviously, uh, but they are in the context of a conflict. And um, part of the funding for the work, I mean, the work was originally commissioned for um, Documenta, um, the exhibition in, in Germany in 2012. And part of the funding came from a, a TV broadcaster in Germany. and. Um, with the, the kind of the, the condition that the work would be shown on TV. And that started off a process of thinking. I wanted to make something that would be uh, suitable for a, a, a TV audience. Uh, and my understanding of TV is very much based on a notion that the TV is this kind of uh, middle class medium. You know, it's a chance for the middle class to talk to itself about itself. And I wanted to partake in that and I wanted to make a, a family melodrama. And so I was careful or tried to be to script, to write the script in a sense of uh, very much a melodrama. I mean, you see this couple, they're preparing uh, a festive uh, homecoming, uh, a meal, and um, you know, they pick up the sun. It's, it's emotional, it's ex you know, they're excited, it's, it's tense, the son is a bit weird, of course he's been somewhere else, he comes home, it's the prodigal son. Uh, they want to embrace him, they want to bring him in, and he sort of resists, and then little by little, so far it's very familiar terrain, and then, you know, little by little, of course, well maybe not so little, there's maggots on his plates, but um, um, little by little the, the, the relationship uh, appears more and more uncanny until there's a, a cliff, and the story literally sort of drives and then jumps off the cliff uh, because the next time we see them, it might be a day later, it might be a week later, they're driving to the train station again and they're picking up their son, but it's not the same guy and he's wearing the same uniform and he's kind of put through the same motion. So uh, as a home audience watching this on TV or as a, um, um, a gallery audience, you have to immediately sort of recalibrate your expectations and to take this notion of family and to understand that this is you know, this is not going to be your sort of uh, family channel type family, you know. Uh, it's going to be um, uh, something else. <laughs> but it's interesting that actually there seems to be a literacy among people watching movies that allows for you to do these sort of twists and turns. All of a sudden we see the same uniform with the same name, but it's a different guy and we accept it and we go with it. Whereas I think if I would, as a curator, install the same room, have the same room and install it with the same artworks in, in a different way, people would be immediately extremely confused because they're sort of like not used to it. So in film, perhaps there is a possibility that allows you to, to uh, create these effects and maneuvers that, that in other places you, you or other mediums you couldn't. Um, well, I think the art audience is actually an extremely generous and extremely sort of tolerant audience, and um, a film audience is um, uh, possibly a broader audience and maybe one who's, you know, in the art house sense, is kind of trained for these kinds of non sequiturs or these kinds of discontinuities. 
But it's not incidental, of course, that the work is called continuity. I mean, um, there's a, 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 let's call it a bigger sort of cyclical notion of, of history, um, uh, what's happening in Afghanistan, the notion that history is not a linear progressive enlightenment sort of history, but rather uh, cycles of repetition whereby the, the country is uh, being occupied by different forces who try to project uh, force and an agenda, a political agenda on the terrain. Um, and uh, fail to do so, or uh, fail in some sense so that there is a repetition involved. Um, and this, uh, this sort of gets um, very specific in the very last scene that you see, uh, which is kind of a compression of two bookends in, in hard history. I mean, on one hand you see this kind of, you know, the Rückenfigur, the, the, the sort of the woman standing at the precipice and then the man. Um, we think of Caspar David Friedrich, Kaspar David Friedrich we, we think of romantic uh, German uh, painting, and then it plunges over the precipice and we fast forward in art history to uh, Jeff Wall's um, uh, mural, Dead Troops, Dead Troops talk. Um, I thought somebody was gonna just clap for Jeff Wall now, but it's just that uh, I'd clap for him. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, uh, Jeff Wall made the photo um, I don't know if you know it, but uh, I think in the early 90s, and uh, it's called Dead Troops Talk, and you see literally a kind of, um, um, this kind of abyss uh, where soldiers are lying in various um, uh, stages of mutilation, but they're not dead. Uh, they're not alive either. They're somewhere in between. They're holding up bits of their flesh and they're sort of laughing, and uh, some of them are just pondering the afterlife. And it's a wonderful photo, uh, but the, uh, the, the soldiers, uh, it's Afghanistan and the soldiers are Soviet. And so in this rendition, the, so, uh, the soldiers are now, of course, German. And um, they're, in a sense, part of this kind of uh, history or historical sort of timeline that doesn't have um, an end, that is actually much more about uh, repetition. And once you acknowledge that, historically, you obviously see that in the, uh, in the work itself, this notion of continuity and discontinuity <coughs> is very much at play. You have three tableaus, three scenes that keep repeating, and the discontinuities are eventually what you're actually watching for. How is it different this time than last time, uh, and what does that say about the characters we see? Well, the differences are enough there to keep you entertained, keep you focused, keep you... Uh, following the, the narrative, and at the same time, they are not uh, as severe as for you to sort of lose the plot of their repetition. But I wanted to get back to Jeff Wall, because uh, Wall was talking about the idea of the undead and the space between life and death that really interested him, which is also in a space, I suppose, where there's a sort of idea of the eternal return, and you cannot escape, and you're sort of like going through the same emotions again and again, and I wonder if that was anything that you were thinking about as well, because you could have gone on with this endlessly. They could I have did. met <laughs> 365 people for every day of the year, or go on and on for as long as you want, until the actors grow old. And um, I did, actually. We, um, in um, um, uh, James Cohan's uh, gallery, um, I'm sure he's here somewhere, um, tonight we're showing um, a work that is um, was created after this, this was uh, created. In a sense, it's, uh, it's a parallel war, uh, work, uh, and it's almost a kind of an, an alternative uh, situation involving some of the same characters. Um, and so there's this kind of uh, parallel portrait, and so not only inside the work uh, do you have this notion of a repetition and continuity, but actually now inside the gallery space you have uh, this weird parallax view where you kind of see uh, the same family and the same characters going through uh, different, uh, <laughs> different motions and different uh, traumas. But I think the notion of, you know, the notion of the undead um, is, is, is very uh, central to how the work was originally conceived. I, I mentioned that it was uh, originally a, a commission by Documenta, and what I wanted to do was totally different, and this is very often the case. I, Carolyn uh, Christoph Bakarjev, who is the director, invited us to visit um, every artist to exhibit uh, a site uh, or several sites uh, around Kassel, who, which were uh, important for her. And one site was uh, originally a monastery, a Franciscan one, after the Reformation. They kicked out the, uh, the monks and turned it into a prison. Uh, during uh, National Socialist times, they obviously uh, changed uh, the prison and brought in some new prisoners. And after the war, and think about this in the 
sense of continuity. After the war, they uh, uh, created a uh, reform house for young women who kind of didn't match the sort of aspirations of uh, New Germany afterwards. And this usually meant uh, young women who were coming from a particular socioeconomic uh, class, namely poor, uh, who got in trouble, uh, who got pregnant out of wedlock. And so they were brought into this house and put in there and they weren't able to leave. And the work that I wanted to do after visiting the site actually involved uh, interviews with them, which I started to, to do. And I wanted to um, uh, create a performance in Kassel where zombies, female zombies, would be um, lurching about in this kind of spectacle that is uh, Documenta. And these female zombies would appear like zombies. They would be uh, undead. Uh, and when they would be cornered by, you know, selfie uh, shooting uh, um, tourists and whatnot, they would begin to kind of spew out, instead of uh, blood or anything, they would spew out this re recent history. Each one of them would be responsible for a particular biography of one of the women I interviewed. And uh, so that was the original idea, and then I presented it to Ka uh, Carolyn on the phone, on Skype, and she said, oh man, that's very nice, make a film. Um, and it was over. <laughs> uh, the project was stopped in its tracks. I tried to convince her she would have none of it. She didn't want zombies. She didn't want any, any of this. And so the notion of the undead um, lives on in this work in the, the little sort of B-movie horror references that you see, uh, the severed finger, the floating eyeball, the maggots, uh, this kind of uh, reference for what it's like when we slip out of linear normative time and we go into something, in, into something else. And I would connect that very much with my uh, and many others' notion of trauma and thinking about these parents as traumatized for whatever reason and having this notion that their time is, has been disrupted. It's no longer uh, a, a sort of a normative, um, you know, efficient, uh, productive linear time, but rather a, a, a cyclical, loopy time in which things can pop out in the middle of their living room, camels can appear in a German uh, Landstrasse, uh, you know, they can guide them like messenger-like into the forest and we know what happens in the black forest. Um, and uh, the undead could be a site to consume, uh, but they don't react. They just get back in their vehicle like good middle-class citizens and continue with their project. Um, yeah. How long have you lived in Germany now? 15 years. 15 years. Well, I, <coughs> I, I spent 10 years of my life in Germany and looking at this film, I don't know how you did that, but you captured exactly that sort of middle-class milieu that I'm familiar with from, from Germany. The dad is being a dentist or something, and they have like their BMW and their one family home, and they have their like nice red wine from Tuscany. And it's like the, all the tropes that existed within that sort of social sphere sort of oh. um, coming up there, even with like the son having the little basement uh, room where he can smoke dope, and which is something I wanted to ask you, that, that sort of reference to, to, to drugs, the, seemed like a detail that mattered to you. Careful, my parents are here. <laughs> <laughs> they smoke dope. Uh, no, I mean, I never thought of the father as a dentist, actually, when I talked to Andre, the, the Just the because actor. he was always checking out the teeth. Exactly. So why was he doing that? That's, that's brilliant. N from now on, he's a dentist. <laughs> 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 just like, they are so basic, but yeah, you yeah. Know, they have a certain wealth, but not too wealthy. So it's that, like, you know, for me, this sort of translates dentist. Uh, <laughs> for me, for me, he's, he's obsessed with hygiene, so he's the guy who cleans up. So the, the, the mother, the wife, in their relationship is the one who has the vision. She's the seer. But he seer. was the cook and she was the cleaner. But, but they switch roles on weekends. Uh, oh yeah. And that's really important. <laughs> um, no, she's the, one who kind of, she's the one who kind of has the vision. In the sense, she's the director and he's the producer. And so he is the one who is in charge of uh, creating these spectacles for her. And if you go to James Gohan, um, uh, to the gallery, you will see how he creates these spectacles for her. He does it online, he does it using social media, uh, but he also does the dirty work. And so, as you've seen here, when dinner is done and mom is kind of relaxing and having a good time, he's the one who kind of quietly sort of takes the dishes away uh, and cleans up. He's the one who kind of puts the garbage uh, away into the car. He's the one who inspects uh, these It was guys. unclear what he was putting in the car there, at night and fog. It's, they're having lots of guests for dinner, you know? It's, uh, and Germans recycle, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's not like here. <laughs> they put it you in know. the car and drive to the recycling bin. Of course, of course, yeah. 
No, he's, hygiene is a big theme in the work, and he's very much concerned with hygiene. The idea of the son or the soldier, or that character being an escort, or like the whole thing being sort of like some sexual scenario that the husband is setting up for, the, for his wife, was that something that you thought about before you started making the film, or is that something that just sort of like occurred to you after watching, watching it? I mean, uh, the, 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 the shoot was very uh, tightly scripted, so there's very little in there that is not um, planned. It's just um, like something that absolutely do not, doesn't come out of the movie at all. But as soon as you mentioned it, I was like, oh yeah, of course. This is a, to this is a, you know, a, a possibility. Yeah. I mean, uh, there, is a, there is a, you know, the parents do cross some lines with their, you know, oh, uh, course, with their, yeah. with their um, sons. And the fact, I think the second Daniel, the one who tells the story, uh, the fact that he's kind of waiting for that to happen is to me, you know, there's a, a couple of clues that are in there, but it was important for me not to give too much of a backstory so you don't sort of see, uh, in this piece, uh, you don't see them um, kind of, because I think having it open-ended in that regard, you know, allows you to kind of project your own little uh, fantasies, uh, uh, you perverts, uh, into this kind of scenario and to come up with, with uh, something else. And I've always been shocked by how many people I've talked to try to normalize the situation and talk about these sons as being brothers. I mean, somebody told me, they're brothers. And uh, I'm like, whoa, you must have an extremely repressed uh, um, um, a situation there. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, for me, I had to explain to the actors what they were doing. Uh, actors don't like ambiguity they don't like uh, most actors don't like that so you have to tell them okay this is what your job is this they hire you and you're in the situation and um, all of that is kind of then cleaned off when you're editing the work and you try to kind of make sure that the hints are there but they're not overtaking the the central sort of ambiguity in the story namely what the fuck's going on with these uh, parents well, let's move uh, away maybe from this immediate film, but uh, the, the theme of war and, and personal trauma is something that's been going on or runs through several of your works. Uh, and again, I wanted to see if that has anything to do with your own experiences in growing up in, in a country that's in constant conflict with its neighbors and, and um, has sort of like this, this history and past. Um, I... I sort of resist the, the, the sort of the biographical explanation for this because I think it tends to kind of, um, you know, tends to sort of pigeonhole the work in a way. Um, and for me, there is no sort of biographical, uh, biographical explanation. I mean, I did move uh, between um, Israel and the U.S. while growing up. And so, um, you know, I'm, I, I was aware very much of Israeli culture and the notion that trauma... Uh, was very much present, but it was also very much instrumentalized um, um, by the state uh, in order to <coughs> create a narrative that allows young men to uh, join a military and to fight and to do things for the state without necessarily questioning them. And these things have obviously begun, I mean, there, there, um, um, questions are now being asked. Um, but for me also the notion of identity was not very fixed because we moved between uh, two countries and I, I moved as a teenager and so I um, had this n interest not only in this kind of notion of na national myth and this collective sort of history and the way that it's instrumentalized but also uh, a very early notion that identity is very closely related to performance. I mean I could put on an American accent or I could speak Hebrew, and I, oh, I never felt uh, uh, sort of native in either place, um, um, but never felt like a complete stranger. And so it's kind of like the undead. It's like being a zombie, I suppose. <laughs> Although you, you don't, uh, yeah, there's no bits falling off um, yet. So I think the, the, that, that would be as much as I'd, I'd say about the biographical stuff. Um. When I saw your work, the earlier work, um, another artist came to my mind, which was uh, Peter Watkins. And I, I wonder if you're familiar with his work at all. Yeah, yeah. Because he's really the only other filmmaker that, I've, uh, that I know of who's employed this strategy of interviewing um, 
the cast of a film as if they are still in the role, yeah. like you did that several times. No, no, I think I, I think it's a, a wonderful um, comparison, although I haven't seen. Yeah, <coughs> we had we had we showed his film um, um, here uh, during the New York Jewish Film Festival, I think two years ago, um, and he's sort of like a forgotten genius, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the last time I saw a film of his may have been over 10 years ago, and it was the one about the, the French commune, do you yeah. know? Uh, and the actor is, I don't know if you know um, uh, the filmmaker Jens is talking about, but um, at least the film that I now, pop that pops in my head, you have these extremely theatrical scenarios involving um, uh, the French commune, and, and, um, and uh, the actors are very much performing a role, they're dressed up, but you also have a notion that they're on a set and then occasionally they break off and they have, uh, you know, they address the camera and they talk. And for me, um, you know, uh, as an artist and as a filmmaker, of course, this notion of illusion is something to be uh, played with and more often questioned with in relation to the apparatus and so yeah, on and yeah. all these uh, notions that have been already brought up and talked about in uh, film criticism, but um, uh, film uh, theory. But, um, you know, this, this kind of work is very much fiction-based, and yeah. I, I tend to work in two modes. I have a, a kind of a, a more documentary mode where I need to kind of go out there in the world and talk to people whose work uh, and whose lives are, are interesting to me, uh, or, I, and I, I tend to oscillate between them, uh, or a more sort of fictional mode where uh, there's nothing here that's, quote, real, there's, there's no, uh, carcass that, uh, you know, dog-like, I dragged home and uh, picked apart and tried to reform um, into, uh, into a story. So th this, is, this, is, uh, this is fiction. Uh, and I think the comparison to Peter Watkins might be more uh, apropos, maybe, or more direct with, with other works, uh, maybe one that we're showing at the gallery now um, with a drone uh, sensor operator. Yeah. yeah. Um. Maybe um, we just open up and see if the audience has some questions for you. That was quick. That's good. I like that. Wait yeah. for it. Wait, we have a little a microphone there. Um, yeah, yeah. They're not. They're not. Um, you know, they're not super famous, but they're uh, well known. Um, I, I think. Austin is kind of a little famous, no? What's Who's his name? The dad. Yeah, Andre Andre Henneke uh, yeah. he's called. Yeah, he's he's quite well known. Theater um, actor more than film. No, no, no? he's a film, film film guy. Yeah, he doesn't do theater as far as I know. Hi, um, I had the pleasure of seeing your new work at James Cohen this week. Yeah. And uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of the propaganda film in Spring, and if we could compare it at all with. Um, this vision of the other that we see in the second Daniel's story about the Afghani family. Um, okay, so in Spring, I mean, Spring was made, and many people who are not here will not have had maybe the chance to see it, but uh, Spring was made um, way more recently, uh, and it was shot um, at the um, end of uh, 2015, uh, and it involves the same uh, couple, but um, it shows, it literally is a, a kind of a, a, a portrait, a double portrait, and a very uh, loopy, a very strange portrait of two young men, one of whom is a teenager, one of them whom is older, whose lives uh, intersect very violently in the film twice. And you kind of literally see one man's story through his eyes, and then the story then switches over to the other man, uh, and they have a direct impact on each other. And one of the young men is a, a, a teenager, and the film doesn't, or the movie doesn't show, doesn't really delve very deeply into his personal life, but it shows him, like any teacher, uh, teenager, that he's kind of obsessed with uh, the computer, with screens, uh, with social media. And what he watches on social media are young men of his age uh, engaged, you know, kind of heroically driving uh, in a desert while, um, in this case, the, the uh, uh, national anthem of the Islamic State is playing in the background. And I think for him, this is, uh, um, this is a, a kind of a, a model or an ideal of what masculinity is. I mean, he's not, he doesn't have the right sort of background to be one of the Europeans who might actually act on that and, and cross borders in order to join this. But he kind of watches it 
uh, with detachment, but I think with, with, with some kind of notion that this is something he's really interested in and where he's going to take it is, is unknown, but it causes some friction with his mom because she kind of blames him for, or she kind of tells him that he keeps on wearing the same sort of black outfit, which is, you know, now well known. But um, it's just a very small detail, uh, and for me it's just about where his uh, sort of uh, imagination is, is leading him. What significance, if any, was the, I think it was the third one, correct me if I'm mistaken, but uh, who didn't, who had lost his, or not, never brought a backpack. Second one. It seemed, I, I, I can't think of a reason why. I, I mean, I actually, I can think of several, but they don't, I asked the question. What's the significance, Ivana, of the forgotten? Of the backpack. Backpack. Yeah. Well, the backpack is obviously something that you lug your stuff in, yeah? Uh, and so in one sense, he doesn't have an, a history. Uh, he doesn't have objects that sort of accompany him that he might bring. And the father then asks him, do you have things on you? Do you have a wallet? Do you have a license? Do you have, maybe bad stuff is going to happen to him and the father is kind of, uh, wanting to know where his identifying information might be, but he's lost it, and so that's a, uh, that's a, a problem. But I think more importantly, uh, these parents are engaged in a very sort of ritualized, very obsessive process. <coughs> and any break in that process, like a theater, any time the actor in a sort of mainstream classical play breaks through that barrier and begins to address you or forgets her line or whatever, any time that happens, uh, it causes anxiety. And so for the parents, the loss of the backpack, the loss of part of the costume that he's supposed to bring is something that immediately uh, induces anxiety. And so the mother marches off and the father, again, he's the guy who cleans up. He's the one who has to clean up the mess. And so when we see him next time, he's got her scarf, the blindfold around his shoulders, and then he's way more aggressive with him than he was with the other guys. He becomes... Uh, much more abusive uh, towards him as a result of the uh, that little mishap, you know the, the the what is it called the costume malfunction, um, wardrobe. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm not up on my. I mean, but that's been a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, picking up the first Daniel, the the mother notices something in the trees, and she keeps looking back. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. And the second time they pick up Daniel, she's looking for it again. But it's not there. But it's not there. And right. the third time, she doesn't look anymore. But and it's I in the middle of the street. <laughs> oh, that's, pardon me? It's it, in the, oh, it was a camel she first It's a camel, went. yeah. <laughs> oh, because to the, to the viewer, it's just this large something. In a it's a little and silhouette. And uh, if you're driving, you know, 50 miles an hour uh, and looking, you know, it's, it's going to be very brief uh, the way you see it. But it is a camel, and it was uh, the only dromedary camel in the Berlin metropolitan area. Um, it, his name is Ali, and he didn't, he didn't read the script, uh, and he showed up on set, and camels are very anxious animals, so they, if they travel, the circus who owns Ali, Ali had to bring him with another camel. They cannot travel alone. So they came together to this uh, street, and we had closed off the street, and they opened the, the hatch or the, the, the truck where, and the, both camels just ran for freedom, do you know? And then there was this kind of like madness of trying to find the camels. They were going into the woods and eventually the producer, who else, uh, grabbed the camel by the fur and pulled him back. And um, every take that we had, we had many, many, many takes. Ali, who, you know, is a very gifted camel but doesn't care for scripts, he would kind of run past the car and never stop. And so when he finally stops, it's because the two trainers are, you know, <laughs> they have really big whips and they're just cracking their whips and he's kind of stunned. Um, and he stays in front of the car and then there's a third guy who's throwing pieces of Wonder Bread just off camera in order to lure Ali into the forest where he's supposed to go. And this happened two hours uh, it was, was two hours after we were supposed to wrap that shot and move to the, um, you know, to the chasm where the, the dead guys are, are sitting. Um, and uh, I, I think it was maybe the 17th take when we finally got Ali to do what he was supposed to do in a, 
in a single take. It was magical. Uh, you know, it happened. And um, I gave him a big hug and I sent him home. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? I think of what I found really interesting is that cartoon. <coughs> Yeah. Just can't do it and realizes that he's frustrated or something. That, is that your sense that, that, that history is not going to move or change his frustration? What well, was your take? Uh, I think my thinking was, was very reactive to what was happening in Europe at the time. And Europe is, has a burqa issue, of course. Uh, and it has a, an immigrant um, uh, issue and now a migrant issue. And these. Uh, uh, communities are very often North African and or uh, Middle Eastern, and they uh, have uh, they exhibit a kind of uh, religiosity, uh, which is uh, very threatening to many Europeans. And uh, so I was thinking of uh, France at the time, which was kind of uh, trying to write it into the legal code that this kind of dress uh, was not permissible. Uh, and the notion that this kind of the, the, of the burqa as a as a screen. Uh, obviously for the, the kind of the Western sensibility and also for the Eastern one of, of hiding what's behind it and by hiding creating more of a mystery what's, of what's behind it and the notion that this kind of pathetic Western uh, soldier is trying to strip this woman of her protective layer and is just you know doing it over and over and over literally exhausting himself and is unable to do it it's a little bit of a, a, a little animation that's in there. It's a little detail, but it was just meant to kind of, um, you know, bring bring that idea into the uh, into the film. You know, the notion that you want to strip something that's strange, but you're not going to be able to. And the work deals with the exotic by actually incorporating it into a very familiar domestic setting. And so we don't have real Afghans. We have these kinds of undead ghosts who appear in situ in the living room. Uh, we have a real camel, but he's not in the real place where he's supposed to be. We have these soldiers who are dead, but they're not victims of war, or they're not aggressors of war. They're sort of undead, but in a, a kind of a nether region that's neither Afghanistan nor uh, Germany. And the parents kind of look at it again. Uh, they take it all in, uh, they internalize it, and then life and their project must go on. They're, so it's about this kind of compulsion, not only to strip, but to sort of continue uh, and to try to kind of, through this repetitive ritual, to kind of create a functioning relationship. I mean, and that's what the piece eventually is about. It's about the relationship between these two crazy parents. Yeah, it's, I read this little um, cartoon there, I almost really like... Um, um, condensation of the entire film and the meaning of the entire film <laughs> and just like endless no. repetition you actually never really come to uh, an understanding of what is in front of you um, but it's interesting that you like really um, um, use a lot of sort of like tropes of like experimental cinema like the idea of the film within the film and the non narrative and uh, the fragmentation of, of the flow um, and so I just wanted to maybe, because we talked about Peter Watkins, what are other filmmakers that, you, that you're drawn to or whose work has inspired you that, or that you look at or point at as a reference? Um, I think uh, um, I had a chance last week to present my, um, my uh, uh, feature film, my cinema film here um, in New York. And um, uh, that immediate reference was, uh, f for that was uh, Bresson's uh, Pickpocket. Uh, there's a wonderful, uh, the, the, the stories to me are very related in, in that they have two young men who are, um, whose relationship to reality has kind of been disrupted. And many of the subjects that I'm interested in, have, you know, they don't have a normative sort of connection to, re to reality. That has been disrupted either through an accident, uh, you know, a, a loss, uh, a trauma. And so what they need to do when that rupture exists is to actually work around that in order to reconnect. And so if we think about the protagonist in Pickpocket, what he does in order to actually be closer to his fellow beings in the metro, in Paris, uh, on the street, is he becomes a pickpocket. He starts at home by attaching a watch to uh, a table, and, he, and, and we see him, and it's beautiful, and it's sensual, and it's intimate. He tries to strip the table of the watch, and the table becomes this kind of proxy for what a human being is. Uh, yeah, he's rehearsing. He, what's that? He's rehearsing. He's rehearsing, of yeah. course. Yeah, yeah. 
And so th that was really important for the film. Um, for continuity, wow, it's been a long time. I don't remember the... Uh, What's interesting yeah. with Bresson, because he's one of my favorite filmmakers, and mm -hmm. I would have not really brought you and him together in the way that he's so absolutely simple. It's a man extremely of no pretentious. Yeah. <laughs> and Sorry. you have so many different layers of meaning and, and mm. details and, and perversity in this movie. Where was this thinking? Well, this is almost like a Bunuel style fantasy here yes. with like the soldier, yeah. like this whole setup. That's like straight Bunuel. Yeah. Yeah, the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie. I mean, this is yes, for me, uh, yeah. you know, the... the uh, this um well, even the, the rucksack, I thought of it as the glowing box and, oh, yeah. and um, yeah, yeah. Belle de Jour. You know, yeah. something that we never know what it is actually about, yeah. but it's sort of like a... All right, I think we're running out of time. Maybe one last question here, very urgent. <laughs> That's the microphone. I'm wondering if also um, Kurosawa Rashomon has been a kind of influence. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's where my idea Very came from, from that being yeah. three different stories seen by three different people, you know? Yeah. All right, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.